Hi guys, Steve here, and this is another video on using GarageBand specifically on the Mac. Before I became a teacher, I used to be a professional touring musician and a studio engineer, and so I put some tips and tricks together for you to get the absolute best out of the software, including recording soundtracks for your YouTube videos or for your background presentations for your school projects. We're also gonna be doing a chapter on recording guitars featuring one of my mates, Mike Sol, who's an awesome guitarist. So it's a lot of fun. Get out your Mac, try and follow along with GarageBand and have a great time. Here's a chapter summary with timestamps so you can easily move backwards and forwards between chapters for later on. First thing we're gonna do is simply set up a new project. So at the bottom here, if you can't see the GarageBand icon, then just simply go to the Spotlight button or you can press Command Spacebar to open up Spotlight and just start typing in whatever app that you're searching for. In this case, GarageBand, just hit enter and that will open up a new GarageBand project. Now, just to start with, we're gonna choose empty project, and double click on this, and that will just go straight into a new project and it will give us a few different options. We can choose a digital or virtual instrument, it's called a software instrument, which is basically like connecting a keyboard or an electronic drum kit. They're not real instruments, they're digital instruments, and you can very easily manipulate these instruments in your project. This is fantastic if you wanna experiment with different sounds, different types of instruments, but they will definitely not be a real instrument. For real instruments, you wanna click on the audio option, and that's for recording microphones, or things like plugging in a guitar or a, a bass guitar, anything like that, that's an actual real instrument and it's gonna record audio files as opposed to digital MIDI files. So we'll go over that in more detail as we go into different chapters on the different types of instruments, but this is the basics that you need to know. Now, any of these can be added later on, so it doesn't matter whether you choose an audio on or a software to start with, you can add many, many tracks as we go on. The drummer option is for putting together loops and drum sounds, and this is fantastic as well, but we're not gonna be doing that right away. We'll just start by choosing a software instrument, and we'll press create and it will go into a brand new page that looks like this. We can see that there's our track there. In this particular case, it's a classic electric piano. And if I wanted to add in a new track, it's very easy to do that. There's a few different options. I can go to track and just go new track, or you can go shift command N, that's the shortcut for it, and it will create a new track and there you go. So now I can add in a real life instrument, like an audio microphone press create and then it will give me the option here to start recording the microphone and you can see that I already have the microphone connected and this is actually giving me a really nice signal and I'm ready to record. So these are your tracks, you can add as many tracks as you want. This little window here shows what I've actually recorded. So if I click on the record button over here, it gives me a little intro and then it starts recording my vocals and it's recording to a metronome. The metronome is up here, it keeps me in time. If I want to turn the metronome off, I just simply click on it and it will still record me, but without that click, 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 click in the background. Okay, if I want to stop, I can press stop or space bar and that has now recorded a little bit of my audio here and I'll go into what you can do with that. You can loop it and you can edit it and cut it up, but we'll do that in another chapter. But this is just the very basic thing to get everyone on the same page, to start up a new project, create some new tracks, understand how easy it is to press record and to change an instrument. If I wanted to change this classic electric piano into another instrument, I could go over here into this list over here. I could click on guitar, for example. I could change that to an acoustic guitar, virtual instrument, or I could go to orchestral, change that to a brass instrument, like a French horn, and I could record my keyboard in and it would sound like a French horn. So very easy to start a new project and, and create new tracks. And once you've done that, you will be ready to start recording and start having fun mucking around with your different instruments. The next really important aspect of starting up a new project in GarageBand is making sure you've got the correct inputs and outputs. An input is anything that goes into GarageBand, like a microphone that might be connected, or a USB MIDI device, like the keyboard that's connected to GarageBand. An output is anything that goes to the sound that you're listening to. So it might be the headphones that you've got connected to your laptop. It might be a pair of speakers that you have connected to an external sound card. So in my case, I actually have my computer connected to a thing called an Apogee Duet, which is a device that allows you to input two instruments or two microphones 
microphones at the same time and also allows you to output to some speakers. So I'm a big fan of Apogee. They make lots of different devices like the Quartet, which has four inputs or outputs at the same time. But there's lots of different brands and lots of different types of external sound cards that you can use. To select the right inputs and outputs, it's important that you click on GarageBand at the top left corner there and then go to Preferences. Under Preferences, you have an Output Device option and an Input Device option. You may not have an external sound card, so you might need to go straight to the output and choose Built-in Output. And so if you've got a pair of headphones, for example, connected to your headphone jack in your Mac, then you want to select on that one, and that will output your sound to the headphones. Input refers to what goes into GarageBand, and so I've got everything running into my Duet, but you might want to just record with the built-in microphone on your Mac, and that's fine too. So you just need to click on built-in microphone. But I'm gonna keep both of mine on Duet, and that enables me to make sure that when I've got an audio selection, I can see that the microphone is activated and I've got a really nice sound down here. And some sound cards will actually have their own software. So the Apogee Duet actually comes with an Apogee program called Maestro, and this enables me to select what kind of input I want. So I can choose a line in instrument, or I can choose a microphone. And so this will appear differently depending on the type of sound card that you have. If you're just using the input of your Mac, then again, all you will need to do is make sure that you've got input and output selected to built-in, and that will automatically connect to your microphone that's built into the Mac, and you're ready to rock and roll. If you're new to GarageBand or digital audio workstations or doors in general, you might be overwhelmed by the amount of different icons and menus and buttons that there are. So we're just gonna go over a few of these to make sure everyone's on the same page. First thing that I'd recommend while you're in GarageBand is to click on this little question mark icon in the top left corner. This actually activates all these little hints and tips. So as you're going through and you highlight a button, it'll actually give you an example or an illustration about what that button actually is. There's a few things that we're gonna point out to make your life a little bit easier. The first thing is these little arrow keys. They're for just navigating through your project as you start to record. You're gonna be going forwards and backwards all the time. Now you can use these little arrow keys or you can use the actual arrow key that are on your keyboard next to your question mark. And if you click on those left and right, that's actually a really easy way of navigating too. These are not your normal arrow keys. These are the little arrow keys next to the question mark on your keyboard. Okay, if you wanna go back to the start of a project, you can click on that little icon there. But the little shortcut that I use is the enter key. So to go back to the start of the project, I hit enter and that goes back to the start, ready to go. To play and pause, of course, you can click on play and stop on the menu here. But I actually like to press the space bar. And when I press space bar, it starts playing. And if I press the space bar again, it stops. So they're really helpful little shortcuts. To record, I can click on the R button and that will activate R for record and that starts to record whatever we're doing. And I can also press the record button up here. If you're a noob or a newbie to GarageBand, then I recommend having those turned on just to help you get through the menus. This little icon here is for looping. So if I wanted to loop a couple of bars, maybe I just wanted to loop bar nine over and over again, I can just click and highlight and drag over bar nine. And if I can turn the loop icon on and off like that, and when it gets to the end of nine, it'll actually just go back to the start of nine and it will just keep looping until I press space bar. So that's what the loop icon is. And the shortcut for loop is actually the C button on the keyboard. So I can just press C and that will turn that loop on and off as well. Okay, over here we have the metronome. Now, the metronome is really, really important. You know, you wouldn't see an orchestra without a conductor at the front to keep everyone in time. And it's the same thing with the project. Metronome can be really helpful when you're trying to keep in time or when you're practicing, when you're just trying to play an instrument in time with the BPM, the beats per minute, then the metronome is a really handy thing to turn on and off. Okay, over here in the middle, these little indicators show a few different things. Tempo. That refers to how fast the speed of the song is going, and you can just click on that and turn that up and down. So if you wanted a slower song, you could just click and drag it down to 100, or you can just double click and change the tempo manually by typing it in, pressing enter. You can also see what kind of time signature your project's in. 4-4 four four refers to four crotchet beats per bar. If you change it to three crotchet beats per bar, then it would have more of a, a lilt to it. So as I'm playing that, it would be three crotchet beats every bar. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, 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 one, two,
two, three, one, two, three. You can change the time signature depending on what kind of song you're trying to create. If I wanted to make sure that my presentation or my audio project was under the one minute mark, then I might actually want to go over here and instead of showing beats and project, I might want to change that to beats and time. This actually shows where I am in the project as an actual time duration as opposed to a bar number. So this is really important if you're trying to work to something specific and keep something under a time limit, you might want to change that. And you can see that showing me, oh, I'm at 30 second mark now, and if I click over here, then I'm at the 40 second mark, etc. So you can fill around with what you want to display here. That's just the beats, that's just the time by itself. I usually go to beats and time if I'm doing stuff to a movie or I want to sync it to a soundtrack for a podcast that I'm making, okay? This is a volume button over here. So volume, you can change the volume up and down. Um, that's that's quite a, a basic one. This one here refers to a little notepad. So you can actually create notes on what you're doing. Uh, in the middle there is the loop icon, and we'll go over this in the next chapter. Loops are absolutely fantastic for creating beats and things like that to record over the top of. Really good for hip hop in particular. I love the loops icon. And you can also import other media as well, like other sounds, and you can do movie files if you want to do podcasts and things like that as well. So there's some of the main icons in your toolbar over here. At the bottom here, we've got this little piano roll and score. And if you wanted to get that right out of the way, just hit the end button and that will get rid of that. And then that frees up a little bit more space in your real estate so you can actually start recording and seeing all the different tracks. If you wanted to see the piano roll, just click on end again and it will bring it up. And this basically means that when you've got things like a MIDI file selected it will show me all my digital data down here and I can swap to score as well but we'll go into that in more detail but I actually like to get rid of that when I'm doing my recording just so I can free up a little bit of space all right now we have a basic understanding of the layout of GarageBand and what some of the main icons represent we can start to record a new project so I want to start by layering down some tracks or some drum loops to record to. Now, you could have the metronome turned on, but I'm going to turn my metronome off and I'm going to record to a drum loop instead. So this little icon that we mentioned in the previous chapter is called the Loop Browser. And if I click on that, it opens up a bunch of different instrument samples or loop samples that I can put into my project. There's actually thousands of these little samples that you can put into your project. But I'm going to start by laying down a kit, a drum kit of some sort. So I'm going to click on Instrument Type and then I'm gonna click on kits, and then I'm going to put in funk, because I want a funky drum kit sort of sound, and that limits down my list to a lot less. So I can go, all right, well there's some blue icons here and there's some green icons. Why are some blue and why are some green? Well the blue ones are real life samples, like audio samples, like what you would record with the microphone. They're actually really hard to edit. So it might sound good, but if I drag that into my project, I can see that that actually looks like an audio wave, which I can still loop, right? So I can actually click on this little icon in the, in the top right corner and still loop these as many times as I want, but it's really hard to edit. So if I wanted to change the beat, maybe put in two kicks and two snares or something like that, it's really hard to do with an audio beat. It's still kind of possible with a lot of manipulation, but a little bit tricky. But what I really like to do is click on these green ones because these are MIDI samples. And if I click on that one, for example, and then I drag that in as a new track. You can see that this actually has all my digital data. If I double click on that, one, two, I can see this digital data down here. And this is all of my MIDI data, which I can really easily manipulate. So if I go back to the start of the project by hitting enter and then I press space bar, all of these different green icons represent a different part of my drum kit. So this one here, if I click on that, you can hear that that's actually a snare. This one here is a hi-hat. Okay, that's actually a snare as well, but a different type of hit on the snare. That's probably a cymbal, I would imagine. It is. Okay, another snare hit down here. Tom, these are kicks, two different types of kicks, okay? So if I wanted to change this beat, I could actually move things up and down. I could change the duration of something. I could copy and paste it. Okay, by pressing com Command C, Command V, or just holding the Alt key, which is really easy. If I make a mistake, I can press Command Z to undo that. 
So this is a really cool way of seeing what actually makes up the MIDI drum loops. Now, next to piano roll, I've got this little option here called score, and if I click on score, it actually shows me what my notes look like as a actual score notation. So if I click on the space bar now, it's, it's giving me a score notation representation of that digital data. And I can also manipulate these as well by dragging these notes up and down. And we'll go into score notation later on. This is a fantastic way of printing off a piano improvisation or something like that, okay? So loops are really, really important. I really like them. And it's a great way of laying down the base fundamentals for your project. So we might keep this beat for now and I'm gonna loop it. Now you can actually just copy and paste things so I can highlight it and press Command C and Command V. And then I could just go, okay, I wanna paste that there and go Command V and then just paste that as many times as I want. But an actual really easy way of doing this, I'm just gonna remove, I'm just gonna turn off the drum loop so you can see the screen a bit clearer. So I'm gonna delete those. And instead of copying and paste it, when you click on a, any kind of loop, in the top right corner here, you've got this little icon which looks like a loop. And if I click and drag on that, it actually enables me to just loop whatever I've got selected as many times as I want. And I can keep going. So I can go, okay, now we've got about 20, eight bars worth of this actual beat. Okay, so if I go back to the start and I press play, it's gonna keep looping this. And then when I get to the end of that loop, you can see it just keeps looping that exact same beat. Great way of laying down some fundamental bass tracks and beats to your GarageBand project without you having to necessarily always record to the metronome icon. The metronome icon, you can still turn on and off. You can hear that metronome in the background, but I can turn it off as well. Now the cool thing with GarageBand is that even after you've added your samples, I can still go back and I can go back to my tempo here and I can still change my tempo. So if I wanted to make that faster, oh, that was a bit too slow, let's make that 100 and I press spacebar, you can hear it's a lot faster. So we've added a drum loop of some sort. Now what might you want to add next? You might want to add some percussion. So I can go back to my drum loops, get rid of kits, okay? And I might go, well, let, let's go to maybe some percussion. And there's percussion and there's a few tambourines in here. Okay, it'd be cool to have a tambourine in there. And to drag the loop into your project, I always recommend dragging it under an existing loop. So I might go funky strut tambourine and let's put that, and let's maybe not put it in straight away. Let's make it come in on bar three, okay? So I put it into bar three and then I loop that a bit more, maybe loop that a few times. So then when I get to bar three, I'm just gonna click the space bar again. It gets to bar three and there's my tambourine. And that, is sounding pretty funky, right? Now, if your tambourine is a little bit loud or whatever instrument you've added in is a little bit loud, you can change the volume up and down just by clicking on this and changing the volume. So if I thought my tambourine was a bit in your face, I might wanna turn it down a little bit. And then when I click on the space bar, a little bit more inconspicuous or not as loud and in your face, okay? So there's some basic drum beats in my project, in my loop section. Now, it doesn't just have to be drum beats or percussion beats, it can also be melodies. You can add in piano sounds and you can add in a whole bunch of different loops. But we're actually gonna do in the next chapter an actual physical play. I'm gonna plug in my keyboard and I'm gonna actually lay down some piano tracks. But if you aren't very confident at doing piano or you might not even have a piano keyboard at home, you can start just by mucking around with all these different loops. And it's a great way of getting down some basic soundtracks, or some basic loops for your YouTube videos or even some hip hop music, rock and roll. So once you've got some kind of drum beat or loop into your project, you're ready to start layering more instruments on top. So to do that, I'm gonna talk about virtual or digital MIDI instruments. And the first thing that you need to do is make sure that you've got some kind of instrument 
connected to your Mac. So in this particular case, I've got a Roland FP7, which is an 88 keyboard, an 88 keys, uh, fully weighted keyboard, quite expensive. You don't need something like this to record MIDI. You can use any keyboard that has a MIDI output at the back. If it says MIDI output, then you're ready to go and you can usually just connect to the USB port of your Mac. If you don't have a USB output MIDI, it might be one of these older looking MIDI connections, which looks like this then you might need a converter to get into your Mac. But any keyboard in the last sort of decade should have this MIDI uh, standard USB connection output. And if that's connected to your Mac, then all you need to do is go over here and press plus button and double click on software instrument like we talked about before. And that gives you a list of different things you can choose from. Now by default, it actually goes straight to this classic electric piano sort of sound, which is a kind of a cool sound. I don't mind the sound at all. It's a nice sort of sounding electric piano, but you might go, no, I actually want something different to that. You might want to go, I'm looking for a trumpet, so you can type in trumpet. And then these are all my trumpet garage band samples. So if I go to pop trumpets, for example, and then go back to my keyboard. Cool, but I'm not looking for trumpets right now. I'm gonna start by recording a piano. So I'm gonna go into there and choose piano. And I'm gonna choose, I really like this one, the Bosendorfer Piano Studio sample. And I'm gonna click on end to get rid of this so I can see my tracks a little bit clearer. So if I wanted to record now, and I was say halfway through bar six, for example, remember the hotkey to press is enter, or I can click on this little button here, take me back to the start of my project. And then when I'm ready to go, I just hit record. It gives me a little bit of a countdown and then I can start recording. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so that is my piano track that I just laid down. Now, I actually made a little bit of a mistake and you can see over here that this little part of my pattern is slightly different to the other ones. I didn't mean to hit that key. So if I double click on what I just recorded, double click, brings up all the MIDI data into this window down the bottom here. Now, if I start playing that, And when we get to this little section here, you'll see that I've actually played a dud note there. I didn't mean to hit that dud note. So I can actually click on that note and just simply hit delete and it will disappear. I can also view what I've just recorded by clicking on the score button and it will show me the score. Okay, but I'm gonna go back to piano roll and all I was doing is really holding down chords and playing a little bit of a bass line. And once you've recorded a few different digital instruments, you might wanna have a go at recording a real instrument and we'll get into that in a moment. Let's just record a little bit of brass before we move on. I need to go to plus button, double click on the software instrument and record in a new brass section. So I'm gonna type in brass over here. And let's go to a brass ensemble section. Okay, and pressing N to get rid of this window down here for now. And I'm gonna press record and just record some basic brass stabs. So here we go. Now, I don't really like that brass ensemble sound actually. So I'm gonna change that to something a little bit more uh, staccato. So I might go a French horn section staccato because I wanted it to be more tacky. And let's listen to that again. That's much better. Another awesome built-in feature to GarageBand is the ability to record MIDI instruments without even needing to connect an external keyboard or an external MIDI instrument. So to do this, you can press Command K and that will open up the musical typing keyboard, which is actually built in to GarageBand and accesses your normal QWERTY keyboard, so the normal Mac keyboard. And by pressing letters, I can actually make music. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new track here and of course this will only work with software instruments, obviously not with audio instruments. And it's great, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, choose some kind of sound. So I'm gonna go over here and type in gospel voice and grab a gospel voice effect. Okay, and you can hear that over here on the... Oh, yeah. 
All right, so now I'm gonna just go to roughly around bar four and hit record and just record a couple of bars of this particular sound. Okay, hit spacebar, very cool. Um, now I can probably turn the volume down on that so we can hear that playing when we play back. Uh, to close the musical type and keyboard, you can obviously just press the X button or you can press Command K. So Command K to open and Command K to close. And I'm gonna double click on what I just recorded so you can see that in the piano roll. We've turned the volume down a little bit and we'll just play that back. Okay, and I don't like that note, so I'm gonna just change that. Very cool. All right, that'll do. So the musical typing keyboard is very cool because it's built in, and if you don't have an external MIDI and you just wanna quickly record an idea, and I've actually used this on public transport before, I was sitting on a train once, had an idea for a melody, and it's obviously a little bit harder to get used to than playing on a real keyboard, but a very cool function just to start recording your ideas, and maybe you're new to GarageBand and you haven't invested in a MIDI keyboard yet, well this is a great way to start experimenting with sounds and just holding chords down and things like that. And now we're gonna just record a very quick bass line to add to the track before I lay down some audio through the saxophone. So I'm just gonna hit record by pressing the R button. Now I have all of the foundations of my track ready to go, I want to lay down the main melody which I'm going to be recording through the saxophone using an actual microphone, not a software instrument. So what I'm going to do is click on the plus button to start up a new track and I'm not going to be choosing a software instrument because the saxophone is a real instrument and it's going to be an audio instrument and I'm going to be using the microphone. If you're going with a line in through a guitar or a bass, you might want to select this option here, but I'm going to be using the microphone option. So I'm just going to click on that and press create. And you can see that I'm getting a nice clear signal here and I'm pretty much ready to record. Now, what I did before I actually opened this track is I went to my external sound card and this will differ from Mac to Mac depending on what kind of external sound card you have. You might not even have an external sound card and you're just using the internal microphone. You don't even need to worry about this if that's the case. But I have set my input one to microphone, not line in, which would usually be this one here. And I've actually got this thing called phantom power turned on, okay? So that sends an extra voltage into the microphone to get more power out of it. And again, you don't need to worry too much about that today, but you can experiment with this in your own time. One thing that I did check though is I, I was on about 50 dBs for my vocals, but the saxophone is a lot louder than my vocals, so I've actually changed that to around 32 dB. And if you find that when you're recording that it goes right up to the red mark, it means it's distorting and you want to turn down your gain input level. Okay, so this is attached to the microphone. I'm just going to shrink that. And you can see on the window here, I'm getting quite a nice signal. When I play the saxophone, that signal is going to come in a lot higher. It's probably going to be up around here. And all I need to do is press record. So we're now ready to go to record the saxophone. And I'm going to record the main melody over my track. Okay, now that we've recorded the saxophone, we're gonna spruce it up a little bit and make it sound a little bit better. If I just solo the saxophone by itself, it sounds a little bit drab, a little bit dry. So I'm going to, first of all, I'm gonna change the name from audio to, just by double clicking on it, I'm gonna change that to sax. And if it's got an icon like this, this is just the generic icon that all audio tracks have, you can right click on it and you can change it. And there's a whole bunch of different categories you can choose from here. And if I click on woodwind, or wind, you can see there's the saxophone, so I'm gonna change that. To, that looks a lot nicer when you're browsing your tracks. 
Now I'm going to take it off solo. I'm going to double click on the track here, anywhere around here, double click, and it will bring up a few different options, effects, output, and EQ. And I might want to add some delay or some reverb to my track. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to change this to master echo. And I'm just going to add in a little, I'm going to turn this on, of course, you have to press the power button once you've selected it. And I'm going to change that and give it a little bit of delay. Okay, so I'm going to give it about a third there of delay. And let's just solo that and play that track back a little bit. You can hear now that there's a little bit of delay on there instead of being completely dry. And the other thing I'm going to do is go across to EQ and I'm going to change this to, I'm going to just filter out some of the lower frequencies. So these are some of the low frequencies that you, you don't really hear anyway. These are like the bass frequencies. So I'm going to cut them out and I'm going to just boost up the high end a little bit. So when you boost up the highs, it makes the track cut through the mix. So if you've got a vocal track that is being drowned out, instead of just using volume and pushing the volume up, that can often distort the vocals. You can actually use the EQ to mix. So you can boost up the highs a little bit. I'm going to keep the mids in there a little bit as well. And let's just hear that back now in the mix. Okay, that's sounding much better. I might give it a little bit more volume. And so you can go through all your different tracks and do that with all of your different instruments. So there's some production ideas to really help make your track sound better, make things sound a little bit more prominent. If you were doing a soundtrack or maybe doing a podcast or something where you had vocals that were really important, you can use some of these techniques, probably not the echo or delay technique, but definitely the EQ technique to just push that up and give it a little bit more prominence in the mix. Not too much, there's no right or wrong here, so you'll have to experiment with whatever you think sounds the best for your mix. If you have a look next to your track volume slider, you'll see a little pan symbol, which has a little L and an R. That L stands for left and the R stands for right, and it refers to whereabouts you wanna put that audio in the mix. So if you pan it all the way to the left, it'll only come through the left speaker or the left earphone side, or if you pan it all the way to the right, it'll only come through the right side. So it's really cool when you're experimenting with your production to pan certain things to the left and to the right. You might have two people speaking in a podcast interview. You could pan one person's microphone to the left and one person's to the right, and it will sound like a stereo interview. You can position instruments so they sound more like they're coming from one direction or the other. In this particular mix, later on I'll be recording some saxophone, and so what I'm gonna do is put two different layers of the saxophone, maybe one up the octave to the left hand side and one down the octave maybe to the right hand side. Really cool when you're doing vocals and you're doing backing singers and you can pan a bunch of backing singers to the left and to the right. Foo Fighters and bands like that do it with their guitars. They might record dozens of different guitars and pan a bunch to the left and pan a bunch to the right. And that gives you a fantastic stereo sort of sound. If everything is right in the middle, then it's a very mono sound. If you pan things to the left, pan things to the right, you might have a more stereo spread sound, which gives a fantastic dynamic to the overall mix. So my buddy Steve just emailed me his garage band music and he's asked me, Mike, can you add some guitar tracks to it? Absolutely, Steve. Now, the first problem is, how on earth do you get this cable that you know so well into your computer? Well, it's not that hard. All you need is a DI or a digital interface. That could be a small box that just goes straight from cable box into USB of your computer. Or in this case, I've got my guitar effects processor, which happens to have a USB port on the back of it. So if your effects rack has a USB type B connector, which looks like a printer cable, you can plug that straight into your Macintosh and then your guitar can go straight into your DI, or in this case, my effects rack. So I've got GarageBand open up and we can see all of these individual tracks that Steve has actually laid down, which is wonderful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add a track with the, the add track button. So I'm gonna click there. It's gonna bring up a couple of different options for me. So what I want here is guitar. And straight away I can see that it's um, instantly recognizing my Zoom G series effects rack. So I'll go ahead and click on create there. And uh, here we go, down the bottom here, guitar one. Let's just change that to Mike's solo. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. Ready to roll, all right, I've grabbed my ax and nothing's happening there. But if I click this little monitor button here, great, I can actually hear myself now. So the cool thing about 
Garage Band is there's a whole heap of different effects built into the software. So you don't actually need to have a guitar effects rack to get some cool sound. So once you've laid the track, you can go back and you can change any of these effects at all you want to get the sound that you want without having to re-record it all the time. I like distorted guitar, that's kind of my bag. So let's click on this one here. All right, that sounds totally like me. So, all right, let's uh, let's have a crack at this. Let's see how we go. So I'll click on record, it'll count me in, and I can start laying my track. And it doesn't matter if you don't get it right the first time, you can just delete it and start again. That's the beauty of digital music. So I'll just click stop there. Let's back up the track. Let's see how we sound. Click on play. I'm gonna bring the volume down a bit if I want. I can change different tracks, different effects. All right, I think Steve will love that. So um, that's the end of my demo with plugging your guitar into GarageBand. Uh, if you really want to create some great music and have a really lot of fun, get yourself an iPad and a DI, or get yourself a basic Macintosh and a DI. It doesn't have to be too high end. You will have a lot of fun. And of course, get yourself a guitar if you're a guitar player. All right, that's all from me, guys. Back to you, Steve. Thanks, Mike. That was absolutely awesome, mate. Can't wait to hear that in the final mix. Now I'm going to show you a more advanced feature of GarageBand which helps you lock in your MIDI recordings right into the grid which basically means that the rhythm is super super accurate. So for my bass that I played in, if I double click on this MIDI data it will show the MIDI notes and you can see that they're not exactly perfectly lined up. No one can play perfectly, you'd be a robot if you could. And so what I can do is if you're reasonably accurate, you can double click on it, you can go to this thing called time quantize. And I like to usually quantize my notes to around the 16th, not a quarter note, a quarter note would be too small, it would push it to the left or to the right too far, but a 16th for me usually seems quite accurate. Now it only works if you've played reasonably in time. If you haven't played in time or some of your notes are really far out, it might move a note all the way to the left or to the right and then it doesn't sound right. But now that that's locked in, it's actually perfectly locked into the drums. And if I play that back, the bass is locked right in perfectly to the rhythm of the drums. It doesn't mean you have to do that for every single MIDI instrument, and it will obviously only work for MIDI. Sometimes it sounds too robotic, and you have to just do it by feel. But if you've played it like in a piano part, and you oh, that's pretty good, just a little bit loose, then you can tighten it up by double-clicking on the MIDI data, and we can do that for the piano track, for example. Double-click on it and then we go to the time quantize we choose the time variable that we want it to lock into and in this case 16th and it will lock those notes perfectly in but i actually don't like quantizing piano but i do for certain things like bass if it's a midi bass Another more advanced feature of GarageBand is actually the ability to automate your volume settings. So instead of just clicking on a track and changing the volume, this will change the volume of the tambourine for the entire track. But I might want the tambourine to gradually come in, or it might be a string piece or a vocal. So what I can do is I click on the track and I press A. A stands for automation and it will actually turn on this automation feature and I can select things like volume, I can select panning if I want things to move from the left to the right, I can also change the amount of echo and reverb, but I'm just gonna stick with volume for now to make it super easy. Okay, and then you'll see this faint gray line appear over here. Now, if I wanted the tambourine to appear very quiet at the start and come in and be quite loud by the time it gets to the end of the second bar, I can just click on the end of the second bar there and I might just push the volume down to zero and then keep the volume right up just so you can hear the, that's gonna to be too loud, but let me just solo the tambourine now and play that back so you can hear it coming in. And here it gets louder and louder. 
and louder and louder. Okay, so that might be a cool effect for your track, which would sound something like this, unmuted. Now obviously the tambourine is very loud, but I'm doing this to show you as an illustration. And you might have a vocal bit and you go, oh, that was a really loud bit there. So you can just create some indentations and then you can just pull that volume of that section down and you can do that for any instrument. doesn't matter whether it's a MIDI instrument or whether it's an audio instrument. It's a really great production technique for changing volumes to make sure that it's very, very specific instead of changing the volume of the entire track, which I don't recommend uh, doing for sections. I only recommend doing that to get a general idea of what the volume should sound like. Another great feature of GarageBand is the ability to add in video footage into your project. So you might be working on a school presentation and you might have this amazing video that you've exported from a PowerPoint or a Keynote slideshow, for example, and you've gone, okay, I wanna put some soundtrack to that and make my presentation sound better, not just look better, but sound better. So you can drag your video footage into your project and start recording to the video footage. You can use it for commercials, you can use it for your own little company advertising or a school project or a business project. And so all you need to do to drag the footage in there is, I'm just gonna get some old footage that we recorded before from uh, when I was doing some takes. And I'm just gonna drag this into my GarageBand project and drop it in. And you can see that, that footage now is ready to go. It's synced up from the start. You can see at the very top, there's a top layer there which represents the visual footage of my video, which then I can now sync and record underneath. So I can put that on another screen if I have a second monitor set up or a TV connected to my computer, or I can just pop this up in the corner. And so as I'm playing my project, this video footage over here will also change. So if I go a little bit more forwards and press play, you can see that that footage is playing at the same time. And if it was out of sync, I can move my audio to sync up with the video. Uh, but it gives you a great guide for doing things like podcasts or trying to line up soundtracks and doing soundscapes and background music. Very, very cool feature. And I'm really happy that GarageBand has this feature. So just before we go into sharing our final mix, I'm just gonna briefly show you how to print some notation from your GarageBand MIDI tracks. It will only work for MIDI. This is not a substitution for some of the more advanced notation software programs like Sibelius or Finale, but this is a great way to quickly export some of your MIDI data. So all I'm doing is going to a track, in this case I'm choosing my bass track. I'm double clicking on the track to pull up the MIDI data at the bottom. And you can see I've got all my notes at the bottom, which have already actually been quantized in a previous chapter. And all I'm gonna do now is click on the score icon right in the middle and that will bring up the score. Now to print that, all I need to do is press Command P and that will bring up the option to print it. Now instead of just pressing print and sending that to your printer, I'm gonna click on Open in Preview and that will open it up in the built-in Mac program preview, which is pretty much the standard program for all your PDFs. And here I can see there is all my notes for the GarageBand Deep Bass Track and all I need to do now is print that or I can press Command S and just save that to my desktop and I'm pretty much ready with a bit of a notation. So if you had a session player that was coming to play for you and you wanted to quickly print off some music for that session player to play for your GarageBand track or for a teacher to accompany you on piano or something like that, you can double click on the MIDI track, pull it up, make sure that you've clicked on score first and then just press Command P and don't go straight to the printer Go to open in preview first and you're ready to rock and roll. Once you've finished recording and you're happy with your mix and you've done all your editing and you've done all your automation, mixing, EQ, compression, anything like that, and you want to get this soundtrack out of GarageBand to put into an MP3 or a WAV file or an A file, it's very easy to share your project. All you need to do is go right to the top where it says share, click on share, go down to this option here, export song to disk. Now there's a few different options depending on what you're trying to do, but export song to disk is the option that I usually take. And when I click on that, it gives me a few more options. These options down here refer to the type of format that you're trying to export your sound as or your audio as. So 
MP3 is a very common type of file, but it is a compressed file. So that basically means that the audio isn't lossless, it does compress and it doesn't sound as good as if you just did a WAV file or an A file. Okay, so AIF is a Apple format, which is still compatible with most of the main programs. WAV is a more generic, older type of lossless format, which I happen to use quite a lot. And that is much more compatible, uh, especially if you're using different programs to work on projects like going from Pro Tools to, to Logic to other various DAW programs. So if I choose MP3, you might want to up the quality a little bit. If you're just listening to you know really old headphones, it won't make a huge difference. But if you're playing this file format on a really expensive stereo, then you will hear the difference. And in that case, I would recommend going as a WAV or an A file. WAV files sound so much better on high quality sound systems than mp3s. I'm not a huge fan of mp3s because I don't like compression but this is completely up to each individual user and also you might need to save space and some programs might only be compatible with importing mp3s. So in this particular case I'm going to choose mp3 and I'm going to do the very high quality one and then I'm going to press export and just save this to my desktop and it goes through and consolidates all the tracks into one mp3 one file and then that one has just been saved to my desktop as you can see over here and you can rename this if you want to to whatever and then I can add this into my iTunes library by just dropping it into iTunes or I can put it into another project that I'm working on it could be an iMovie project and that is pretty much the end of GarageBand so let's just pop this track into this iMovie video and listen to the first 20 seconds or so to see what the finished product sounds like thank you guys have a great time recording hope you come up with some amazing improvisations some amazing compositions some amazing soundtracks for both your school projects and just for your own songs as well and here it is guys the final mix hope you've enjoyed following along good luck with your future projects